My name is Raymond Phillips. I'm a board certified gastroenterologist. And our topic of discussion today is the status of flatus. Uh, always an interesting topic uh, for almost every person in the world. Now, before I begin, I wanted to introduce myself further. I'm part of a group, a gastroenterology group of Naples. We have a Pepto-Bismol pink building with solar panels that we installed more than a year ago. And in this past year, we've generated 95,000 kilowatts of power and have saved 72 tons of carbon dioxide as a result. Now on to disclosures. The, uh, these are the various pharmaceutical companies that we've worked with over the past four years in the context of clinical research. We work with Abbott all the way to Salix on topics dealing with gastroesophageal reflux to chronic hepatitis C. Now this is an outline of our discussion this afternoon. We'll consider the historical perspective of the issues of flatus, review the composition of intestinal gas, consideration of sources of intestinal gas, and finally consider volume of gas in the, in the GI tract. But most importantly now, we'll consider gas disorders such as excessive flatulence, odor, bloating, and the therapy for these conditions. Now, in all of medicine, all of medicine begins with Hippocrates. These are his dates from 460 to 370 before the Common Era. And Hippocrates made observations with regard to flatus, but his principal observation was that passing gas was good for your health. These observations were expanded by Galen. And these are his dates, 129 to 216 in the Common Era. And he made a connection between the ingestion of diet and the production of uh, flatus. In particular, noted that the increased consumption of legumes led to increased production of gas. Flatus, as an issue of society and consideration of society, uh, was first brought to the attention by the Emperor Claudius. And these are his dates, when he decreed that all Roman citizens should be able to pass gas in public without fear of prosecution. Unfortunately, for flatulent Romans, Constantine reversed this decree in 315 uh, BCE. Now years passed and René Descartes was born. He's the father of modern uh, philosophy, a famous mathematician, and he made the observation uh, and, and studied the issue of dualistic issues of mind and body. That is to say, how do we know what is reality? How do we perceive that? Is it through what we feel or what we think? And he came to the conclusion that uh, embodied in this famous Latin phrase, cagodo ergo sum, or I think, therefore I am. However, before he came to this consideration, he uh, considered the alternative, fetio ergo sum, or there I stink, therefore I am. However, he uh, came to the more famous conclusion, as we said before. Now, our founding fathers, among them Benjamin Franklin, had considered this. And this uh, monograph that he had written to a friend uh, while he was ambassador to France in 1781, entitled Fart Proudly, or A Letter to a Royal Academy. He was very impatient with scientists at the time. He felt that they were pretentious and, and they were studying things that were not very practical or useful. And so he wrote a mocking essay to a friend of his, imploring uh, and suggesting that the study and, and research on foods that could be looked at to make flatus more wholesome and sweet smelling would be beneficial. And that compared to other scientific endeavors, that this research would be far superior and that this other research would be scarcely worth a farthing. Now, the issue of flatus is entertainment. Long a delight to children and adolescent males came to the stage of the Lumo, uh, at the Moulin Rouge in, in uh, 1892 in the form of Joseph Pujol, Le Pet au Main, or his stage name, The Farting Maniac. And he had learned the capability of being able to uh, ingest large amount of air and, and, and be able to expel it at will. And he could extinguish a flame at five yards. And he could, uh, he could play a tune on a flute. And to the delight of the French audiences, he could carry La Marseillaise. At uh, any rate, dignitaries across France flocked to see him. Sigmund Freud, uh, Edward II, uh, as well as the, uh, Leopold II. Uh, nonetheless, his, the, the delight in his performances waned, and after World War I, he retired uh, to, to uh, produce biscuits in a factory in South France. Now, the issue of, of flatus, uh, there's, uh, there's a word in every language. 
uh, for flatus. In Japanese, it's he, Russian, perdun, Chinese fong, German furs, French pet, Hindu pud, Afrikan preop. The issue, though, of flatus as a medical problem became apparent in this case report uh, reported in Gastroenterology in 1979 entitled A Fatal Colonoc uh, Colonic Explosion During Colonoscopic Polypectomy. And let me give you a little details about this case report. A 75-year-old white male had a filling defect, uh, defect on a barium enema that showed a suspected small cancer or small polyp. He underwent a colonic purge or preparation with using an agent called mannitol, which is a sweet, non-absorbable liquid and induces a terrific diarrhea, but in the process, it is fermented uh, by the bacteria in the colon and generates the, a large amounts of hydrogen. Well, with a colonoscopy, a scope was passed into the colon, air was placed into the colon, uh, and of course, as you know, air is comprised of 21% oxygen and 79% nitrogen, and then uh, uh, an electrical snare was placed around the polyp and electricity was, was applied. Well, in that environment of hydrogen, oxygen, and electrical spark, there was an explosion. Uh, the gastroenterologist was thrown across the room, uh, the scope was, crossed, it was thrown across the other side of the room, and the patient's abdomen exploded and he died shortly thereafter. But it highlighted the medical power of flatus in terms of influencing individuals' health in a very, very dramatic way. Now, the principal gases within the intestine, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide, hydrogen, and methane, are all represent about 99% of expelled intestinal gases and are colorless and odorless. Their concentration is a function of their location within the GI tract. Now, upon swallowing, uh, air goes down the esophagus, arrives within the stomach, and that air is comprised, uh, as I said, of oxygen as well as nitrogen and a small amount of carbon dioxide. As we proceed through the GI tract, through the small intestine, and finally to the large intestine, there's change in the concentrations of these gases. Now, the composition of intestinal gases, minor component, represents uh, I, various compounds that are generally referred to as a, uh, well, they're hard to spell but easy to smell. And this highlights a capability of human olfaction. In this area of uh, these particular compounds, it's extraordinary. We're able to detect one part per billion, which is comparable to what a hound can, uh, or dog, uh, can perceive with uh, routine odors. These compounds are sulfur containing materials, including methanothiol, dimethyl sulfide, hydrogen sulfide and short-chain fatty acids such as acetate, butyrate, propionate, uh, scatols, endols, volatile amines, and finally ammonia. Now, the sources of the intestinal gas represent air swallowing. Well, as I said, with, with swallowing, uh, you ingest air, which is nitrogen as well as oxygen. But with each swallow of two teaspoons of fluid, you swallow three two teaspoons, or about 15 milliliters of air. Some of this you belch up, but the balance of it passes through your GI tract. There's diffusion from the blood, uh, where carbon dioxide can diffuse into the, the lumen of the GI tract, uh, as well as nitrogen into the, uh, the GI tract, and then intraluminal production, which we'll consider further. Now, with the schematic of the GI tract, as we see, as air enters the stomach, it's principally oxygen and nitrogen. That is rapidly absorbed, the oxygen, uh, across the mucosa or the lining of the stomach into the bloodstream. Uh, nitrogen flows down a diffusion gradient. As we move into the small intestine, the duodenum, the hydrochloric acid produced within the stomach flows into the duodenum, and there, enormous amounts of a base called bicarbonate produced by the pancreas as well as the biliary tree combined with the hydrochloric acid and produces great quantities of carbon dioxide. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide arises enormously uh, within the proximal stomach and that leads to a marked diffusion gradient where carbon dioxide then flows into the bloodstream. But there is a marked decrease in concentration of nitrogen, so nitrogen flows from the bloodstream into the lumen of the gut. As we proceed down the small intestine into the large intestine, the remaining material not absorbed by the small intestine, fermentable substrates or substances, are, are then fermented by bacteria within the colon, and that's where we release uh, trace gases, the ones that are more odiferous, as well as carbon dioxide, methane, and hydrogen. Now, 
this is something that everybody understands, but it's important to understand the quantitative differences. As we go through the stomach, there are more and more bacteria as we leave the stomach into the small intestine and finally arrive in, within the colon. The stomach is essentially sterile. There's hardly any bacteria. In the small intestine, the first two or three feet, there's very few bacteria as well. But as we progress through the 18 feet of small intestine, uh, there is a greater and greater quantity of bacteria to the point in the lower portion of the small intestine, there's almost uh, 100 million bacteria uh, per uh, milliliter. Now, when we make a transition from the small intestine to the large intestine, there's a quantum increase as far as the concentration of bacteria, up to 10 trillion uh, bacteria per uh, milliliter, and a vast number of species. At this point, quantitative, around 750 species. Now, in this next slide, what we'll see, these species have various uh, bacteria, have various capability of fermenting saccharides, uh, uh, polysaccharide fermenting bacteria that leads to production of carbon dioxide, hydrogen, these short chain fatty acids. Um, also we have carbon dioxide fixing bacteria. But going on to the next slide, uh, this capability of production of gases has been utilized in various fashions because as we proceed through the GI tract, uh, particular sugars, say for example an individual lactose intolerance, uh, that lactose uh, that's, uh, that we all take in when we're uh, children, uh, some individuals lose that ability to digest that lactose. And if you cannot digest the lactose in the small intestine, it'll proceed through the small intestine, arrive within the colon, and that will lead to production of hydrogen. If you can, and as you'll see on this particular diagram, which outlines the result of a breath test investigating lactose intolerance, uh, after the ingestion of lactose, about 60 minutes later, as when the lactose arrives within the colon in an individual that cannot digest the lactose, there'll be the production of hydrogen. So this capability of gas production has been utilized uh, for, uh, as a means of a diagnostic tool, uh, in this case, for lactose intolerance. Additional point though, as we said, methane is produced uh, within the colon, methane and hydrogen. And these methane producing bacteria are quite unique and it has the capability, these methane producing bacteria, of taking hydrogen and taking carbon dioxide, taking four moles of hydrogen and one mole of carbon dioxide and, um, and producing one mole of methane. And this, uh, this leads to a marked reduction in the volume of gas being produced within the colon. So these methanogenic bacteria by reducing hydrogen uh, and using hydrogen to reduce, uh, reduce carbon dioxide allow for an overall reduction in the volume of, uh, of gas within the GI tract. Not every individual produces methane. Individuals who are constipated tend to produce more methane and these, these methane producing bacteria principally occur uh, and exist within the, the lower half of the colon or the left colon. Now methanogenesis has several clinical implications. It's been associated with constipation. It's led to the clinical condition of uh, uh, methane within stools and hence the capability of stools floating. Uh, but a more uh, uh, important uh, medical connection is that the presence of methane may lead uh, or put a person at a higher risk for the development of colonic neoplasia through methylation of DNA within the colonic mucosa. This is a cow, and a cow, as you know, has four stomachs. And uh, the, the initial portion of, of the cow stomach is the portion referred to as the rumen. It can hold 50 gallons of fluid. It leads to the reticulum, a filtering structure, which then leads to the omasum and then to the abomasum. The abomasum is very similar to the human stomach. The significance uh, of the rumen of the cow is that when material is chewed and swallowed by the cow, the rumen is an area where methanogenic bacteria, bacteria that produce methane, break down the cellulose material and allow the cow to be able to absorb the nutrition from this material that humans cannot absorb. The consequence of this, though, is the production of methane, which the cow gently burps out each day, producing 500 liters of methane each day. Uh, around a half a pound of a um, 
methane each day, around 142 kilograms uh, per year. Now you might say, so what? Well, let's consider the issue of the greenhouse effect. Now we need to consider the physics of the greenhouse effect. Now the sun, each day, delivers to the outer atmosphere of, of the Earth 343 watts per square meter. On a cloudless day on the Earth's surface, 240 watts per square meter is delivered in power. That is absorbed by the Earth's surface. It warms the Earth's surface and that energy is radiated off in the form of infrared radiation uh, which then goes back through the atmosphere into the space. So 240 watts of power delivered to the Earth's surface, 240 watts of power are reflected or emitted from the Earth's surface. In the atmosphere, there are certain gases, greenhouse gases, that can absorb this infrared radiation and readmit this radiation, some of which is reflected down to the Earth's surface. The more greenhouse gas there is, the more this process occurs, more of this infrared radiation that's, rated, uh, that's uh, reflected from, or emitted from the Earth's surface is absorbed and then reflected downward so energy is retained uh, at the Earth's surface. Now these are the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, which is quantitatively the largest amount, 56%, methane, 18%, chlorofluorocarbons, nitrous oxide, ozone, water vapor, but methane has a unique chemical structure that makes it 20 times more efficient than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas. So even though by volume it's a min minor component, it far outstrips some of the other greenhouse gases as far as its effect. So this phrase from the 1960, think globally, act locally. Well, Flatus stinks locally, but acts globally. Now, Let's consider the amount of gas in the GI tract. In a healthy individual, there's about 200 cc's of, of gas within the GI tract that's divided between the stomach, the small intestine, the ascending, transverse, descending, and pelvic colon. In the preprandial state, before eating, there's about 100 cc's of, of intestinal gas that's even at least distributed between these six compartments. In the postprandial state, as a result of swallowing air, uh, there's uh, immediately an increase up to 200 cc's and principally this accumulation of gas occurs within the lower portion of the colon, the pelvic colon. So there's this, uh, and this bar graph demonstrate that. In the beige we see a preprandial state and the, and the dark blue, this is the postprandial state. And as we go from left to right, we see the stomach, small bowel, right colon, transverse, left colon, pelvic colon. And immediately after eating, within 22 minutes, there's a rapid accumulation of gas uh, within, the, uh, within the colon, principally the left colon and pelvic colon. And this represents the um, motility of the GI tract propelling this gas uh, downstream, if you will. Now these are the different clinical gas problems we're going to consider. Voluminous gas, excessively odiferous flatus, impaired gas evacuation, abdominal bloating and distension, and we'll consider each in turn. But before we do, we need to have a, a frame of reference. The normal range for passage of gas is around 10 to 20 passages per day. And this is not age or gender specific. There is no difference in terms of frequency with regard to age and, and gender on this issue. However, uh, the, the volume of gas that's passed each day is a direct function uh, of the type of diet we ingest. A low fiber diet is associated with around 214 milliliters in a 24 hour period. A high fiber diet, a fiber uh, diet that contains beans, a 200 gram bean diet will lead to a dramatic increase as far as the volume of gas produced in this particular study, 705 milliliters in a 24 hour period. And this brings to mind that apocryphal scene from that movie, Blazing Saddles of Cowboys sitting around the campfire eating a plate of beans. And I'll, I'll spare you the specifics of that. Now, voluminous gas though, there are other items that will lead to production of gas. And these are items that you would not normally consider. Complex carbohydrates, wheats, oats, potatoes, corn, we are not capable of absorbing these items 100%. We're only about 90% efficient as far as absorbing these carbohydrates. And as a consequence, 
10% of that nutrition is left over, arrives within the large intestine, colon, and is fermented and leads to gas production. Rice, on the other hand, is almost 100% absorbed, so it leads to very little uh, gas production with the uh, ingestion of, of rice. Fruits, uh, vegetables, particularly legumes, uh, lead to uh, contain indigestible oligosaccharides such as stachyose and raffinose. Um, there's carbohydrate malabsorption, very specific conditions such as lactose intolerance that we considered uh, earlier. Fructose intolerance is, is of interest, particularly in this age of high fructose corn syrup. Uh, fructose is, a, um, is the sugar that's in fruits and it's been concentrated in various carbonated beverages uh, because it's fairly inexpensive and it can be used as, as an effective sweetener. But there is a certain level of fructose that we all can absorb in a, in, a, in a particular meal, about 50 grams of fructose. And that's precisely how much fructose is in a serving, a 12 ounce uh, uh, um, carbonated beverage that's sweetened with a high fructose corn syrup. So if you drink more than one of these beverages, two or three, you may very well have GI symptoms as a result in terms of gas production, cramping, and, um, and, um, and perhaps diarrhea. Sorbitol, which is a non-absorbable sweetener that's present frequently in various gums as a sugar uh, to allow them to be sugar-free. If you chew enough gum, you can absorb enough of the sorbitol to lead to gas production. And celiac disease in the form, uh, which is a condition that's fairly common, about one in 150 people have it, can lead to lactose intolerance and malabsorption of various carbohydrates. Now we considered air swallowing before, if you swallow a great deal of air. A lot of high school students and college students love to show their prowess as far as belching and that leads to air swallowing and although you may be able to belch and make quite impressive sounds, not all of that air that's belched uh, is, uh, is evacuated from your stomach and the balance goes through the GI tract. Gastroesophageal reflux disease will lead to air swallowing as a, as a result of increased production of saliva uh, and the saliva can, containing a bicarbonate that helps neutralize acid reflux. Small bowel bacterial overgrowth can also lead to gas production. And, um, uh, but the issue of voluminous gas is interesting. You can have increased gas, but it's rarely associated with increased pain because your GI tract is very effective as far as passage of gas. And it's rare that individuals will have a great deal of pain associated with large amounts of gas production unless they have a particular condition called irritable bowel syndrome. Now, on our next slide, uh, we'll consider therapy. And dietary restrictions would follow from the items that we've discussed before. Uh, and in particular, it's hard to follow, though, various dietary restrictions because you become used to the diet that you've grown up on. Uh, various interventions, such as uh, seen on our next slide, beta galactosidases or BINO, uh, which is easier to pronounce, is effective as far as digesting some of the more difficult uh, components of vegetable products. However, in the studies that have been done, this efficacy has been limited to the liquid uh, product and not so much the tablets. Uh, we can look at specific carbohydrate malabsorptive abnormalities, such as lactose intolerance that we see here once again on this breath hydrogen test. On the next slide, what you'll, uh, their activated charcoal has been investigated, but it's ineffective. Antibiotics have been looked at, and we'll consider that further as a means of reducing the, the bacterial population, but it's not a long-term solution and not a desirable uh, solution, particularly in this age of increasing resistance of bacteria uh, to various antibiotics. Probiotics has received a great deal of attention, uh, but in the, in the area of gas production, volume production, the studies have been very inconsistent and very small and cannot be recommended at this time. This is a topic that we all must consider. Excessively odiferous flatus. Now the noxious odor of flatus correlates with hydrogen sulfide methanthiol. And these two products, uh, the hydrogen sulfide and methanthiol, they are toxic, very toxic. Uh, as toxic as cyanide, and the mucosa of the colon has developed means to metabolize these agents very rapidly to thiosulfate, which is a harmless. Now, one component of garlic, allomethyl sulfide, uh, is not metabolized. It is absorbed 
through the mucosa, the lining of the colon, into the bloodstream, exhaled in the breath, and it is the odor that's associated with garlic. And so hours, even a day or two after ingesting a garlic meal, you can continue to exhale this particular uh, chemical in your breath, uh, even though the meal has long since uh, been imbibed. Now, as far as the treatment of odiferous flatus, uh, well, sulfur-containing compounds in food tend to produce more uh, odiferous gas. Um, and so an effort to reduce these particular compounds, in particular cruciferous vegetables, certain meats uh, would be, uh, has been suggested, but it's not really that terribly effective on a long-term basis. Oral activated charcoal has been looked at is ineffective. Maximal doses of Pepto-Bismol is effective in the short term, but the toxicity of bismuth, the toxicity of salicylate, really precludes this being used on an ongoing basis. Now, certain commercial devices uh, using activated char charcoal have been shown to be effective, and we'll consider these further here. This, yes, is underwear, and, and this underwear uh, is an impermeable um, material that's tight-fitting at the waist, as well as tight-fitting at the thighs and, and precludes uh, seepage of gas. And at a very strategic location, there is a pad of activated charcoal which will absorb the emission and be able to uh, reduce and absorb the odiferous components of flatus. Now you might think, oh really? And my response is, yes, really. <laughs> it does indeed, it is produced and it is effective and it has a, um, it's something that is commercially available for females as well as males. Uh, and for those of you who do not like to, as we go on, if you do not like that particular brand, well, there's cushions, activated charcoal that's actually uh, embedded into the fibers of the cushion. Uh, however, the cushions are not quite as effective as the underwear because you do not get an effective seal. It's always a danger for that left cheek sneak, so to speak, and as a result, you can't get an effective seal. Um, but nonetheless, it's a, a non-obtrusive non way of uh, potentially minimizing this problem, say, for example, your weekly bridge game. Now, let's turn our attention uh, to a paired gas evacuation. And this is a, um, uh, as I said earlier, most subjects or most individuals are able to pass gas fairly rapidly and efficiently, and particularly in the erect position. Certain foods, though, will slow this process. Foods that contain fats will delay gas, tr uh, gas transit and will delay uh, motility within the GI tract. And the passage of gas occurs as a consequence of increasing abdominal pressure uh, and in the context of releasing or reducing uh, the, um, uh, uh, you know, the anal sphincter tone. Now with our next slide, we considered this further, uh, this particular issue of abdominal bloating and distension. And almost, this is a daily issue that gastroenterologists see. Indeed, all physicians will encounter with their patients the issue of bloating and distension. Uh, frequently, it's attributed too much gas, but more specifically, the issue is that of bloating or distension. And it's a very ambiguous term uh, because all of us will have a degree of distension following a meal. Uh, it's more apparent at the end of the day. It resolves after overnight fast. But those individuals with irritable bowel syndrome have bloating in the absence of obvious distension. And these individuals have more difficulties, and it's not just an issue of excessive gas, it's more of an issue for them of uh, impaired handling of this gas. It's not propagated rapidly through the GI tract, and it can accumulate in specific areas and lead to pain as a consequence. Now, the, um, to specifically address this issue in irritable bowel syndrome patients, various CT scan studies have been done to measure the volume of gas within the GI tract. And it's been demonstrated consistently that those individuals with irritable bowel syndrome that have bloating, they have normal volumes of intestinal gas. They do not have more gas than normal uh, subjects. However, there's consistently an abnormality in the handling of this gas that is present in their GI tract. And more specifically, there's an abnormality in irritable bowel syndrome patients between the diaphragm and the abdominal wall, which we can see on this next diagram. Here, this is a volumetric CT scan study showing on this view on the left 
a, a supine view of the, uh, of the CAT scan. The green represents intestinal gas. On the right-hand portion, the same individual in the lateral view, we see the intestinal gas that's floating, if you will, uh, toward the uh, anterior aspect of the abdominal wall. Now, the, um, using these kind of studies, we've been able to demonstrate there's an abnormality between the relationship of the diaphragm and abdominal wall, which we can see on this next diagram. Uh, we can see that with uh, gas that's ins insufflated or instilled within the colon itself, there's an elevation of the diaphragm to accommodate this volume. However, in patients with irritable bowel syndrome, this elevation of the diaphragm does not occur, so there's less room in the abdominal cavity for this increased uh, intestinal, intestinal gas to occupy. And as a consequence, there's a protrusion of the abdominal wall outward. Uh, and normally, an individual would have elevation, to review this, an elevation of the uh, diaphragm that would provide adequate volume of space so there would not be protrusion. But individuals with irritable bowel syndrome, they do not have that, uh, that, um, that reflex, if you will. And as a consequence, they have a greater degree of distension uh, that follows a meal. Now, in terms of how to deal with blo bloating and distension, well, non-pharmacological means would be an erect posture, increased exercise, which does lead to increased clearance of intestinal gas. A dietary manipulation to reduce gas production may be beneficial, although inconsistent in its effect. Here, uh, probiotics have shown efficacy. Activia, Align, Fluorstar, VSL number six, these are all probiotics that have been shown to be effective as far as reducing the sensation of bloating, but the, the studies have been fairly uh, small and it's very difficult to study as well. But it, it's worth a try in those individuals in whom have persistent problems. Prokinetic agents, agents that increase intestinal motility, cisapride, zelnorm, or had been available, had been effective, but have been taken off the market. Metoclopramide. Uh, is available, but not really effective in the lower GI tract and not recommended for this purpose. In the post-operative state, uh, neostigmine, pyridostigmine are effective in the short term, but not really useful on an outpatient setting. Cymethicone, which is an agent that you see in many, many different products, uh, it reduces the surface tension so that bubbles collapse, but it does not reduce gas volume. So it does not really have an effect in terms of reducing distension or reducing gas pains. And so the studies have been very inconsistent with this, not showing any more benefit than a placebo. Finally, we turn back to the issue of antibiotics. And now we have a growing body of information that indicates antibiotics may be effective for the control of bloating and distension. And the most recent study, reported in abstract form, uses the oral uh, uh, non-absorbable antibiotic rifaximin We'll see it on the next slide. Uh, in this uh, study, which is a randomized, placebo-controlled, 12-week uh, st uh, study investigating the use of rifaximin in non-constipation uh, uh, predominant IBS patients, uh, irritable bowel syndrome patients. And the design of the study was straightforward. As I mentioned, double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial, well-powered, uh, large number of subjects in each arm, uh, more than 650. Each uh, in the, in the uh, treatment arm, two weeks of rifaximin, 550 milligrams orally, three times daily was administered. Uh, the placebo arm uh, was treated for a comparable period of time. And there was a relief of bloating, relief, an improvement in abdominal discomfort during the period of therapy. But that benefit extended for 10 weeks after therapy. Now, this is not approved by the FDA, um, but it's promising and shows the efficacy of certain antibiotics in terms of influencing the production of gas and symptoms associated with it. So here we come to our conclusion. Uh, we've considered uh, the historical perspective, the broad sweep of history and, and the role of the aflatus in that, uh, in that history. We've considered the composition, the sources of intestinal gas, the volume of gas in the GI tract, finally considered various gas disorders including flatulence, odor, bloating, and the therapy for each of these. So I appreciate your attention and I hope you found this uh, uh, interesting.